Okay, has everybody got the uh, seat they want? Well, excuse me, there are no seats. Have you got the standing place that you want? Uh, the cake walk is later, so don't worry about exactly where you're standing. Uh, I'm Bob Foster with the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine, longtime friend of Gwen Klingman's. We were, she was known as Gr Granny Gwen to our daughters. But I wanted to first thank everybody to, that's, come, that's come here today, however you found out, for the ribbon cutting and grand opening of the Klingman Center for Community Engagement, CCCE. Uh, if you hear that, you probably won't remember. But, uh, and with that, we have several dig dignitaries that have come today uh, to be with us and support this, and some that will arrive later. Um, first, I want to introduce and thank Dr. Uh, Mayor Beverly White from the city of Lewisburg, Mayor White. And Delegate Jeff Campbell, from the city of, uh, from the West Virginia State Legislature, <laughs> Honorable Jim Ca uh, Campbell, and uh, has Delegate Cindy Lavender Bow arrived? We will recognize her later. Uh, Delegate Bow will be here uh, a little later, I suppose. Uh, I also want to thank, and they're in the audience. And would you please? Uh, wave a hand or something as I call your names. These are the public health leaders that have been so instrumental uh, in getting this particular building, but this whole uh, idea of a community engagement center uh, together. Dr. Sally Hodder, there's Sally. Uh, she's the director of the WVCTSI, Associate Vice President for Clinical and Translational Research and Professor at the West Virginia University uh, School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Adam Boss, raise your hand, please. Dr. Boss. Dr. Boss uh, is the Director of Office of Health Services and Research, School of Public Health at West Virginia University. And Lisa Sharp. Lisa, are you there? I can't see a hand yet. Lisa is the USDA Director of Business and Cooperative Programs and Rural Development. And along with her, I would like to thank Kim Tiemann, who couldn't be here today, um, who is with the Benedim Foundation and did so much to help to fund and develop this Klingman Teaching Kitchen. Um, now, there's going to be very short little, little presentations here so you can get a little sense of the, the big picture of this uh, Klingman Center and how it evolved and where it's going to be here in our future. Um, first, I would like to say that Gwen Klingman, um, who I knew very, very well, was uh, served lunches for more than 50 years right behind us on Washington Street uh, at an, a meat market that she bought during the Second World War uh, while her husband was in the Army fighting the war and had it for them to have a living when he returned, but she served lunches in there for more than 50 years. When she was 79, she decided people were coming in asking if there was any rolls from yesterday and a cup of coffee. She started serving breakfast at age 79, uh, all at very, uh, m more than affordable, very low rates. I know that she fed many of the actors with Green Bar Valley Theater, my wife included, and they would just put a check mark on the calendar uh, when they ate there and pay a dollar for each check mark at the end of the month. She fed literally thousands of medical students from the West Virginia School. Uh, and uh, I, I think we can say that she was responsible for uh, thousands of pounds being added to osteopathic medicine in the state of West Virginia. Um, she was the first cousin of Roland Sharp, the very first president of WVSOM, and who hired me in 1978. Dr. Sharp only lived to 105 and practiced medicine to 103. But they were first cousins and more like brother and sister, five years difference up in Pocahontas County. And she used to say that they were in every tree known, uh, every tree that exists in Pocahontas County during their childhood and growing up. Um, he went in, of course, to osteopathic medicine. She wanted to be a physician, but, but got married and the family started. But she always was supportive of the medical school, the medical students, uh, and I'll, I'll let some others talk about that evolution. So she was very much a, a big piece of this 
community, and there is an award from her uh, for 47 years of service. That's after she'd been here quite a while from the uh, business association, which she never joined. And she said, I didn't want to pay that 20 bucks or whatever it was because I could use that to give food to uh, other folks. So let me first bring up Alice Hollingsworth, uh, who is the uh, daughter uh, of Gwen Klingman, to just say a few words about her mom. Good afternoon. My name is Alice Hollingsworth, and I am one of Gwen Klingman's three daughters. Our mother used to say, there's no use to pass this way if you don't help people a little bit. Early in our lives, we learned she did just that. She always fed people. Our classmates, who may not have, have had enough to eat, transients that were sent to her for a meal, the lonely, the sick, and the osteopathic students. She often said she could not stand the thought that someone might be hungry or lonely, and that a friendly face and a hot meal can make a huge difference in someone's life. Kindness and human contact were of the utmost importance to her. Mother did not care about someone's socioeconomic standing or her, his or her ethnicity or anything else that classify people. She cared about hearts and she did everything she could to lessen the burdens that rest in the hearts of many. Mother would say that the osteopathic school was born in her little store because her first cousin and the first president of WVSOM was the late Dr. Roland Sharp. Mother knew that the vision that Roland and other doctors and educators discussed over lunch in her store was to educate men and women to be the best physicians they could be serving in rural communities while being compassionate and caring for all people. For this reason, Mother held WVSOM and students close to her heart. Mother loved all and was inclusive of all people. She served up large portions of food to nourish bodies and even bigger portions of love to nourish their souls and spirits, addressing the physical and emotional needs of those who might otherwise feel that no one cared. She taught all that knew her important life lessons just by being the unique person that she was. By being patient, she taught us to love unconditionally. By giving so much of herself to others, she taught us to always give more than we take. By always standing up for what she believed was right, she taught us to have the courage of our convictions. By never accepting the idea of quitting or giving up, she taught us to make wise decisions. By never accepting excuses, she taught us accountability and responsibility. If she were here today, she would tell you that she was the wealthiest woman in the world because she was able to make a difference in the lives of others. Mother's service to others was of the utmost importance to her, and her example has left an indelible mark on every one of us. She has made an impact on so many. Mother would be honored and humbled to know that a facility that will help the people in our communities lead healthier lives and engage in fellowship with each other will bear her name. My sisters, our families, and I would like to extend our deep and sincere appreciation to the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine, Montwell Commons, and the Greenbrier County Health Alliance in honoring our beloved mother's legacy. You have touched our hearts, but also the hearts of thousands that will benefit from the Klingman Center for Community Engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Alice, and uh, now I'm going to introduce Heather Hollingsworth, which is what she married into from being a Hollingsworth. 
Uh, this is her granddaughter, Heather Hollinsworth. Hello. It's such an honor to be here with you tonight, and I'm really humbled to be speaking on behalf of my family. As the youngest of her grandchildren, I'm perhaps the least qualified to speak. Um, I know that my cousins have many memories of her and their own experiences with her, um, and I, I know in my heart that nothing I could say tonight could ever do justice to the woman that she was. Um, and eloquence is not my gift, but I'm gonna give it a shot anyway. I think I speak for every member of our family when I say that we're so appreciative of the work that you're doing here to honor um, this magnificent woman and continue her work of serving others in our community. Like anyone who ever met her, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to my grandmother, but in a much more personal way as she rescued me from a very miserable fate. So my lovely parents, Luther and Alice, go ahead and wave guys, show them how proud you are had intended to name me after my two grandmothers, which is a very nice gesture, but a horrible idea, because apparently they thought they were giving birth to a Benjamin Button-style child who would age backwards, as the combination of their two names was more appropriate for a senior citizen than a newborn baby girl. My grandmother, who was always ready to speak her mind and a champion for those without a voice, in this case an unborn me, intervened in a feisty way that only she could and suggested the name Heather instead. And thank God my parents acquiesced. It was the Lord's work she was doing. Okay. I grew up spending a majority of my childhood with her in the store. Before there were a lot of daycare centers and preschools in the area, my mom and dad relied on my grandmother to take care of me while they went to work. I spent many happy days by her side in her kitchen, watching her bustle about and preparing hot meals for the community. My personal favorite jobs were making rolls and peeling carrots. I could never understand, though, why my rolls were so teeny tiny compared to hers. And try as I might, my little hands just couldn't produce the massive rolls that her well-seasoned ones could. Nevertheless, the local police officers who came in each day always honored my six-year-old heart by buying my rolls first. And maybe that's why I have such a heart for law enforcement today. As the day went on and people would file in and out for lunch, I fondly remember coloring with the regulars and cleaning their plates for them, bringing them refills for their drinks. Often, they'd leave me tips in the form of small, shiny coins. At the end of the day, my grandmother would always make me split those coins with the other workers. Then, with whatever I had left over, she'd walk me up the street to the open book. You remember the open book? Yeah? And buy me a new book. She always told me that I could never waste money if I spent it on a book. Throughout my life, I'd hear that voice in my head every time I was in a bookstore and saw an interesting book. I'd always reason what Grandma said. So as a college student and a young adult who had to frequently move in and out of dorms and apartments, each time I had to lug these giant heavy boxes full of books up and down flights of stairs, I remember thinking, Grandma must have not moved very much. All joking aside, though, she really was serving the Lord in all that she did. As a woman of faith who loved the Lord, the work she emulated, the work she did emulated him in many ways. Like him, she reached out to serve the ones everyone else had forgotten. Like him, she counted herself as less, always looking out to the interests of others before her own. She realized that we all have one basic thing in common. We're all lost and broken and in need of a savior. And her work of the feeding of the poor and the hungry and loving ones who felt unlovable pointed the recipients of her love and generosity <clears throat> to, the world, to the Lord. She understood that she couldn't save them, but in being his hands and feet, she could point them to the one who could. And that's why she did what she did. It wasn't because she was in a financial or physical position to do so. Often she wasn't. It was because her, her heart broke for what broke his. People who were hurting and broken and lost and needed a little love and light and encouragement in the midst of their darkness. And this is what I learned from her and what I think we all learned from her. While I don't always do it well or as gracefully as she did, I learned to cultivate a servant's heart. I learned that while my life may seem hard or unfair at times, there's always someone in greater need, and I should seek them out to help bear their burden. I learned that we share what we have, no matter how much or, as often was her case, how little. 
I learned that we don't seek our own glory, but we serve others out of humility, understanding that it's only by the grace of God that we have anything at all. I learned that we work hard and we do our best because the work that we do matters. I learned that we never stop learning and we never stop serving. These are lessons I take with me into my world, and in that way, her influence and legacy has a ripple effect outside of this community, because I know each one of her children and grandchildren take them with her, take them with them in their, in her, their hearts, wherever God has planted them. Furthermore, she lives on in the lives of each of her daughters, who embody aspects of her character. My Aunt Nancy has her gentle and humble nature and has taught all of us how to love and forgive. My Aunt Sharon has her courage and conviction and has taught us all how to stand up for what we believe, even when we stand alone, and to speak out against the injustices we see. And my mom, who's my best friend and role model, has her diligence and patience and taught us the value of long suffering in spite of our trials, always looking for a silver lining. Few people can say that they were raised in a loving, close-knit family, but almost no one can claim to have been as lucky as my cousins, brothers, sisters, and I have been to be raised in the tradition of my grandmother, with these three magnificent leading the way for us since God saw fit to take her home. We all grew up as more siblings and not extended family, and I think we count each other as our dearest and closest friends. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that grandma would be undeniably proud of the work her daughters have done to continue to teach their children and grandchildren her wisdom and the value of family and community. As the next generation, we take this heritage seriously and are committed to following in our grandmother's footsteps, serving and loving whomever God puts in our path. We appreciate her life lessons and have dedicated ourselves to making sure the next generation understands who this woman was and what she meant to so many. This center is a great aid in ensuring that her service carries on for generations to come. There are so many, many more things I'd love to share with you, and I know each of my family members has their own special story about this heroic, tiny little woman who was so dear to our hearts. However, I'll leave you with this. Growing up, I remember my dad always telling us kids that before we did something, to consider if we would still do that if our grandmother was there. More often than not, this advice prevented me from making some very bad choices, as the fear and shame of my grandmother ever finding out about any escapades was more than enough to make me course correct. I think my dad might have been on to something. How much better would this world be if we all thought about this admirable woman before we made self-serving choices and instead chose to put ourselves aside for a greater purpose and a greater calling? As you leave this place tonight, I encourage you to do so, looking for opportunities to serve others through random and selfless acts of kindness and honor and memory of my grandmother. Each of us has the opportunity to be a world changer, just like she was. And if we're lucky enough to have been impacted by her life, we have the responsibility to carry it on. So go out there and get to work. Thank you. As the number two daughter, uh, Sharon, comes up here to say just a couple of words, and then we'll move uh, ahead. I, I have to tell you this story, and Alice said I could share it. Alice, come on up, Sharon. Alice and Heather got a, a, a tattoo together as sort of a, a daughter, uh, mother-daughter thing, and was worried the whole time that Gwen might not approve. But uh, when she got back to the little cabin or cottage they were in right after getting this tattoo, less than a few seconds later, a big bolt of lightning hit just about 20 yards away and left a big black spot. So she, and she knew that Gwen is still paying attention and that's what Heather alluded to. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Sharon, come on up. Sharon Schutzer, number two daughter. Good evening. I am Sharon Klingman Schutzer, and um, I am the middle child and the one that mother always referred to as the black sheep of the family. So I think it only appropriate that I speak today because I will tell you a different side of our mother. It is truly with a great deal of love, respect, and appreciation that my sisters, our families, and I are here today to be a part of this profound honor that you are posthumously bestowing upon our mother and our grandmother. First, 
I want to introduce to you the family members who are here today. Our mother and our father were both only children. And our mother always said to me, don't have just one child. Well, of course, the black sheep of the family has one child. <laughs> However, she would be thrilled, as would my father, if they were here today. We'll start with our sister Nancy and her husband Emerson. Emerson became the brother that we never had. They married in 1957. Alice was very young, and I'd like to think that I was young too at that time. Uh, so Emerson was truly the brother that we, we never had. Together they had five children. Three of their sons are here today. I'd like for Emerson Lee, wave, step forward, Stephen Lewis, and Matthew Grant, three of their five sons, are here today. All traveled to be here. Uh, there are two more sons, Timothy Glenn and Andrew Lehman. And Nancy and Emerson have five children, 15 grandchildren, and two and a half great grandchildren. My daughter, Carrie, is right there, named after our mother. She was Guinevere Carrie Jordan. And I have two grandchildren here, Brian and Brady Snyder. <laughs> Alice and Luther have five children and four grandchildren. Luther is another brother for us. Uh, back there are, well, you heard Heather speak, and we have Heather's husband, Cameron, wait, and her two grandchildren, two of her four grandchildren, Corey and Zane Hollinsworth. And Luther, did you raise your hand over there? Okay. Everything that has been said here today, oh, by the way, I have a total for you. That means that our mother, who was an only child, has 11 grandchildren, 21 great-grandchildren, and two and a half great-great-grandchildren. Trust me, she is smiling in heaven today. Everything that has been said about our mother is true. And it saddens us that not everyone here actually knew her. As the middle child whom she blamed for everything in life, including her white hair, I want to share some things with you that have not already been said. She was a very little woman, not quite five feet tall, but she was fierce. She was really quite the character. She was tenaciously stubborn and unquestionably, but delightfully, outspoken. She meant no words. And when she was upset about something, you really didn't want to be on the receiving end of that passion. Ask the town about before the days of our current mayor. Ask the town about the passion from Gwen Klingman when she was told that she had to paint the exterior of her building a certain color. <laughs> See, those laughing knew her. Or ask the bank about that passion when our father was serving in World War II and she had an opportunity to buy the store that she subsequently ran until nine days before her 89th birthday. The bank initially refused to lend her the money because she was female. An independent woman 
before it was fashionable to be so, our mother had the money by that evening. <laughs> or you could, for that matter, just ask me about being the receiving end of that passion. It was years before I knew that my name was not Good Lord Sharon. <laughs> because every day I would see the eyes, I would see the look, and I would hear, Good Lord Sharon. <laughs> I wish I were joking about this stuff. I can simply say that since my angel sisters always made me look bad, if mother were here today, she would be pointing that little arthritic finger in my face and saying, Sharon, don't you ever think that you are too old or too big to be smacked if you need it. <laughs> Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, in his narrative poem, Evangeline, spoke of the beauty and strength of woman's devotion. Nothing better described our mother. She was fiercely but quietly devoted to doing what was good and right and kind and fair. She was devoted to her family her church, her friends, her community, and to making a difference in the lives of those who needed help. She was devoted to Dr. Bob Foster. Now, I live in New Jersey, and I wasn't here when the osteopathic school opened. But every phone call, every Wednesday night and every Sunday night, I heard Dr. Bob Foster, Dr. Bob Foster, Dr. Bob Foster. I honestly thought for a while that this was someone who walked on water. And, and maybe, maybe is, I'm not sure. But as far as my mother was concerned, he, his daughters, and his wife were very, very special. And she was devoted to the students at the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine. She loved them so much that my guess would be that some of them, when in need of a little push, might have been on the receiving end of that passion. It has been said that a bird may fly away, but we can still remember its song. Gwen Klingman's song is being sung here today. It can be heard in every single one of her offspring. It can be heard in the spirit of this magnificent center. It can be heard in the hearts of all of us who knew her and loved her. With the opening of the Klingman Center for Community Engagement, we all pledge to keep her song alive in a world that needs more Gwen Klingmans. This world needs more Gwen Klingman's love, her tolerance, her patience, and her kindness. Our mother and father raised us to be women of faith. So in keeping with that, on this beautiful day and this beautiful occasion and with this beautiful gathering, I end 
by very proudly saying to all of you, let us rise and shine and give God the glory for having touched our lives and for having blessed our lives with our mother, Gwen Klingman. Thank you. Thank you, all those uh, heirs to Gwen Klingman's family. Um, and I want to introduce from Montwell Commons in the Greenbrier Valley Restoration Project, Florian Schleif. Florian. Yeah, my name is Florian Schleif. Um, I came to West Virginia in 1987. And a lot of people have always asked me and said, you're not from here, you speak funny. <laughs> and I've uh, de developed that saying that I am a West Virginian by choice, which makes a big difference. It's not just by mistake I'm here. <laughs> In 1987, this community looked very different. There was a lot, of, a lot less wealth here uh, people really dependent on each other for road trips, for tolls, for repairs, for uh, some uh, things for dinner. And I myself and my wife, we, we moved here because we liked that, that people stuck together and helped each other. But then over the last 30 years, something has slipped away. And I realized uh, a few years ago that we have all insurances we all have security behind us. And we really don't need neighbors anymore we don't like. And in 1987, we had to like neighbors we didn't like because we needed them. We had a fire on the farm. We needed them to come running and help us put it out. And so about five years ago, in 2004, I was driving down here, 219, and I would always look left because I came in from the north and I would see this rundown Fort Savannah with these caved in kind of motel buildings. And I always thought, how could we be the, this, the best little town in, uh, in the United States and having this in our heart? And so I, I uh, went out and saw some friends here in town and uh, out of town. And I told them we should really save this place to create something that is for all of us forever for our children to leave this place in better shape. And so I've, I've worked for the last five years by not just making plans and building things, that's the easy part, but by going to the city, by going to the Planning Commission, the Historic Landmarks Commission, to the Rotary Club, to all these kind of organizations, and, and always tell them this is an opportunity we all should stick together. And it, it says when, when we raise a child, it takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village to build a center place for a community. And so I would like to have all board members of Montwell Commons that are here tonight raise their hand so that you see who is uh, part of us here. And then we also have... <clears throat> We, we have these little things sometimes. People bring us sometimes some, some, some checks, which you know uh, greases the slope, the slippery slope. You, you have to have those. And some of those checks are not just small. So now I want to really thank the Peyton family, the Artar family, the Withrows, the Bakers, the city of Lewisburg, all these people that have helped us in the past support us. And I don't mean forgetting anybody, but they're really lots of people. And so about a year, a good year ago, I heard the osteopathic school was maybe reaching out with a community project. And I uh, was approached by Sally Hurst, who's also here tonight, right? Is Sally here? Can you raise your hand? There she is. <clears throat> And Sally, Sally's very quiet, but she's very persistent. And so she came around over and over again, and uh, Bob Foster got interested and some others. And uh, I can only tell you it's like a miracle 
that we pull this off to have a partnership, not just with our local partners, but with a really important partner, a medical school, that will introduce this kind of creation to their students, to their medical students that can take it all over the country, all over the world as an idea. And they can speak from experience how it looks. And so I, I thank the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine, especially Dr. Nemitz, for their kindness and generosity to work with us because when they showed up, it didn't look like this. It still had a lot of potholes and it still does, but we are getting better. So thank you very much for all of, our, all of you helping us. And thank you for Gwen Klingman because she was one of the people that inspired me in the past. And I want to share one story. I used to go there for lunch. I always admired her making those rolls. And she didn't roll them out and she didn't just make them. She had this technique. She had this dough in her hand. She squeezed them and there came this perfect bubble up. And then she would take that bubble and put it on a, in her pan and make a roll out of it. And she would just make one after the other. And one day I was watching her just out of curiosity and suddenly the phone rang. And I was wondering, what would Gwen do with these hands full of batter? Well, she reached out to the receiver and she took the phone call. <laughs> well, anyway, she was a great lady. And I'm glad to meet all her family. And I'm really honored to be part of this. And thank you very much. Thank you, Florin. And uh, now we're going to hear from uh, WVSOM and the president, Jim Nimitz, uh, about what the purpose of this building and that, uh, that collaboration between uh, WVSOM. So, Dr. Nimitz. Thank you, Dr. Foster. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is really a great day. You know, WVSOM's mission is to serve first and foremost West Virginia and to address the health care needs of its citizens. This Gwen, the Gwen Klingman Center for Community Engagement is an example of what we are doing. It's an example of we're, we say what we're going to do, and we're about the community, we're about improving the health of the community, and this is one of those examples of how we're going to reach out to the community. I encourage you to look at this program and, to, and look at the programs that we're going to be doing out of this center. Programs for the community. Programs for, to teach our medical students about how to interact with the community. Um, teaching people how to eat right. I mean, so, so many West Virginians are dying of chronic diseases, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart problems. Um, and we're here to help with that. We are here embedded in the community to help the community. For me, it is all about people. It's all about you. You know, it's all about taking care of each other. Just like Gwen Klingman, that's why this incredible woman, that's why we named it after her. It's about caring for each other. That's what we're going to do here. We're going to teach people how to live better lives, how to live healthier lives. And we're going to have kindness here where we're going to bring people who are in recovery, this awful opioid epidemic that we have, and bring people here to learn new skills so that they can go out and be part of the, uh, a contributing member of society because that's what they want. We're going to be here to serve others. We're going to be here to teach our students. And we're going to be here to be examples for others so that people will will we'll serve. Um, I really believe that this will be the start of something even bigger. This is going to be a model for the state. This is going to be a model where we're going we're gonna to collect data. We're going we're gonna to see what programs work. It's going to be an incubator for what we can do 
what works, what doesn't work, and then share it with others, and then to encourage and facilitate other communities to create centers like this around the state so that we can improve the quality of life for all of us, for all West Virginians. Again, I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank all of our sponsors who are, who are listed. There are many, many, many people that have been involved to, 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 to make this happen. And, and we appreciate everybody who has participated. I especially want to take uh, to thank all of the people from WVSOM who work day in and day out to serve others. Um, our marketing and communication staff, our media services staff, our Center for Rural and Community Health, uh, which w this wouldn't be possible without that center at our school, our foundation. But I especially want to acknowledge uh, Donette Mija from the Foundation and uh, Sally Hurst from the Center for Rural and Community Health, because they're the ones that put all of this together for, for all of us today. So let's give them a big round of applause. We're coming to the end of, of, of our talks. Uh, Heather uh, Antolini is going to speak uh, a few minutes uh, about the foundation. But the governor is on his way. And um, uh, we originally thought we would bring you in to the reception first. But my understanding is, is he's going to be here uh, within minutes. And uh, certainly, we want the governor to be a part of, of the ribbon cutting. Because again, we see this as the beginning of a statewide initiative. So again, uh, we appreciate your patience. We have lots of food in there for you. Uh, and so um, uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Heather Antolini, uh, WVSOM Foundation uh, Executive Director to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Nimitz. I got to tell you, following that impassioned speech and preceding the governor puts a lot of pressure on me. <laughs> so, um, but we're so glad to have all of you here tonight. On behalf of the WVSOM Foundation, what an honor and a distinct pleasure it is to be a part of this celebration to dedicate and name this community engagement center in memory of Gwen Klingman. I did not know Mrs. Klingman personally, but the stories I have heard about her are heartwarming and inspiring, and I see glimpses of her loving spirit and her beautiful daughters and the rest of her family who I've had the privilege to meet. The board and the staff of the WVSOM Foundation are so very proud to be a part of this community gathering place where programs and activities will nourish the people who come here, much like Mrs. Klingman fed others, both physically and spiritually. We are happy to enjoy the privilege of coordinating the use of this space for its intended purpose. We invite all of you to utilize this building for any event that fosters the principles of positive community engagement and the mission of this Montwell Commons area. And we welcome you to contact us to learn the details about how to reserve this beautiful building for an event of your own. The WVSOM Foundation also honors the memory of Mrs. Klingman through the Gwen Klingman Memorial Scholarship Fund. Inside the building, you will find these scholarship cards that are here tonight to provide some information about this fund established in the memory of this remarkable woman. Proceeds from this perpetual fund are used to award a scholarship each year at graduation to a WVSOM student who demonstrates the qualities of community service, caring, and dedication to others, which was the heart of Gwen Klingman. If you would like to remember Mrs. Klingman and possibly the difference she made in your life, we invite you to purchase one of the 12 small flower arrangements that you'll see on the tables inside, which are available for a minimum donation of $50 to the scholarship fund. The large arrangement on the food table is also available for a gift to the scholarship fund of $150. Or 
If you would just like to make a contribution to the fund in memory of Mrs. Klingman, you may make a gift of any amount to the WVSOM Foundation. Again, it is a distinct pleasure and an honor to be a part of this celebration. May the loving, hospitable spirit of Mrs. Gwen Klingman be ever present in this space. Thank you. All right, the governor is here, and uh, I just wanted to say, as we talked about nutrition, uh, Granny Gwen, at the time she was serving, had 12 or 14 vegetables every day and a different meat item. Uh, she was looking at plant-based diet. There was one thing I think that she didn't know that we maybe didn't know then, but that stick of butter in every pot of vegetables was probably not the best idea, <laughs> although it gave it flavor. So, <laughs> so uh, with the food that's here, and I'm just stalling just briefly here, with the food that's here, you actually have um, plant-based things like meatless meatballs, hummus, some others. So as you eat, look through here, you'll find some very good options for uh, heart healthy and all. And of course, that's what we're teaching our students now in a culinary medicine uh, elective. Uh, and we hope for them to be down here teaching it to the community uh, and passing on the knowledge that they acquire with that. It is my honor to um, uh, invite uh, the governor to the podium and, uh, and to welcome uh, uh, the Honorable Governor Jim Justice and his wife Kathy, uh, who has, the governor has rearranged his schedule so that he could be here today. It's uh, such a great honor to have you with us, uh, Jim, uh, Governor Justice, and uh, can't thank you enough. Uh, thank you so much. I'm gonna go right there. Oh, well thank y'all for waiting on us. We've. Uh, We've been all over the universe. I'm going to just sit right here and talk to you. I thought I was going to have to jump across this, and I thought that would, that would have been pretty ugly. But let me tell you, the, you know, we've been to Charleston, and we've been to Clay County, and uh, I didn't think we could make it. But, uh, you know, they don't give me tickets out on the road, so we're, we're able to move along. But... Uh, it, it's a long ways from Clay County to here, that's for sure, but, but we're glad to be back. And let me just say this, <clears throat> you know, it's amazing what the O school's doing. We all know that. But I, I got to tell you that, and I don't say this egotistically in any way, but there was a day not long ago and it was the first session that I was basically not presiding over, but it was the first legislative session that I had. And right off the get-go, and it just, it almost took my breath, but right off the get-go, there was somewhat of a movement to cut off state funding and to maybe the possibility that the O school was going to end up in private hands. Now, I felt like it was a, not a good move. I, you know, there was a million rumors that were going around everywhere. You could, there was even a possibility of rumors going around saying, well, we're going to move the school and move the school to another spot. Well, somebody had to make a stand and make a stand for us. And I thought, well, gosh, you know, this is right off the get-go. This is one of the first things that's, right on my plate. And I said at that time, and I thought, well, this is going to be a terrible fight. And I don't know all the particulars or all the players, but I said, if this comes to me, it'll be dead on arrival if it comes to me. Now, at that time, as I understand particulars, there may have even been some woes from the O school. Now, so... What did we do? We did something at that time that basically gave you the opportunity to take off and show everybody just how great you are. Now, there's all kinds of stuff that we've been accomplished way prior to that. But at the end of the day, you look what you're doing now. You're knocking it out of the, out of the park in every way, shape, form, or fashion. 
This school is so incredibly significant to this area, this community. And so it was a real honor for me. And today I didn't have any intention whatsoever of making it back here. And on the way back, to just tell it like it is, I thought, wait a minute. There was a time when we had some troubled waters. And I called my people and I said, tell me what happened there. And they told me something that I really never, never knew. And that was when I said publicly that this bill would die immediately if it came to me. And I would say it over and over and over again. Now, it may very well be that some of you would have preferred to go the other way. But this school, to take a chance on this school would have been a bad move in my opinion. This school was doing greatness beyond belief. This school is so essential to not only to Lewisburg and Greenbrier County, but to our state, to our nation, and to the world. You know what you're doing. You're pumping doctor after doctor after doctor into our rural areas and doing so much good, it's off the chart. Now, all I can say is I celebrate all that you're doing. I'm surely not a poster child for the nutritional components of this new facility here. You know, but I can tell you I'm back on the 18,000th diet of my life. I started again yesterday. <laughs> And, and we're going to work at it. But let me tell you, our state's doing good stuff. we still got all kinds that we can do and lots and lots and lots of people to help. I know the other component of what you're doing here beyond nutritional components is the fact that you're going to be able to really genuinely be able to help people that have addiction issues or things like that and help them on their way too. So all I can say is, for Kathy and I, we're, we're honored to be in this great community. Just look around, I mean, for crying out loud, it's just, it's, it's spectacular in every way. What an incredible October day. And, uh, and so if we can get on with cutting this ribbon and making all kinds of good things happen, let's do it. And again, thank you for waiting around on me. And let me say this, before we cut the ribbon, there's a lot of dignitaries here. I see them everywhere all over the place. And I see there's, out, there's people out there. There's no point in me naming everybody. Thank you all so much for everything. Governor, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, buddy. You get, you get the big one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yep, everybody. Now, you know, like, uh, one giant step, you know, or one small step, this is a step really and truly. And again, I'm not the one to, to say this in looking at me, but this is a step for nutrition, for all the opioid situations that we can help with. This is a step for this school and all it's doing in community and state in everything. So God bless you in every way. Thank you. Let's do it one, two, three. One, two, three. Ah, mine didn't work. <laughs> okay. Uh, Governor, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. For All right, no. I, I can't thank you enough. Well, I, I get to keep this part of the ribbon. <laughs>